So welcome everybody. Um, I suspect we'll have a few people showing up over the next few minutes as well. Um, and anybody who didn't make it last time, uh, welcome to you in particular. Um, those that are returning, thanks for coming back. Um, I am going to pop up the same poll that I put up last time. Um, if you did it last time, you do not need to re refill it out. Um, so those of you that are brand new, I would love it if you just fill out. It is an anonymous poll. It just gives me a count um, of the answers to each thing. And it's giving me some interesting awareness into who's watching. Um, for those of you that are new, I'm Rachel Morris. And I'm doing this crazy thing going through the Cogswell book. Uh, and I'm enjoying having people along for the ride. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, so the, uh, there's a few things that I want to cover really quickly that are from last time, just so that the people that weren't here has a, have a sense of it. Um, I've just put up the survey. Uh, there is a Facebook group that you're welcome to join. Um, we'll pop up the, uh, the link to that shortly. Um, and it has a bunch of the documents and paperwork that I'm using. That includes things like a template for tracking each stone you're setting and measuring it and sort of thinking about it the way that John talks about thinking about the um, appropriate setting and style for the project you're working on. Um, and there's a bunch of other documents and links in there. Uh, after last session, I posted all the links that people had posted for um, recommendations. Um, so it's a good little place to visit if you want to get some extra info or if you want to have an ongoing conversation between sessions. Um, just a reminder that this is being recorded and by, by signing up and attending, you're, you're agreeing that I'm going to be able to use your name and or likeness and or voice, whatever is on the recording. Um, I'm going to say I'm doing this in my studio. Everybody is responsible for their own safety in theirs. If you are working along at home or doing it on your own, please take good care of yourself. Um, John used to say that you are the final line of defense in all things about your safety. So take responsibility for that. Um, just as a reminder, the first and third sessions have different registration links simply because Zoom won't let me do it any other way. Um, if I'm only doing twice uh, a month, they don't have a and every other kind of thing that I can do. Um, so next session will be on the other link. I'm going to try and send out those reminders each time. Um, I'm also counting on everybody to be sort of self-moderating. So mute and unmute as needed. Um, I did find that I felt like I was sort of talking to the void last time. So don't hesitate to unmute and ask me questions as we go. Um, that's encouraged. Um, if it gets too chaotic with too many people, We'll back down a little bit from that and ask people to post in the chat. Um, but you can also, if you don't want to say something out loud, you can also bring it up in chat. I may not see it right away, so I may scroll back up and answer it down the road, or somebody else in the group may pop up an answer for you, um, especially if it's about finding resources and so on. Um, at the end of each session, so this was a, a sort of sort of came up partway through last time. How do you follow along? Um, and the answers were all going to work at different paces. I am not going through this at the pace I would go through if I were teaching one of my workshops. So this isn't a full on class as far as I'm concerned. This is you learning along with me as I do some things that I've done before, some things that I haven't. Um, and so what I'm going to do, the first session was what are the tools, go through chapter one and two and start us off. From here on out, I'll always be telling you what I expect to be working on in the next session with the stone shapes that I'm doing, the settings that I'm doing, and the materials roughly that I expect to be using. So if you want to prep for that so that you can do be at your bench while we're working, you go ahead and do that. Um, I'm also, I've got in the guides section of the Facebook group, I've got for each chapter of the book, the settings I think I'm going to be doing um, and the variations and so on. There'll be a little bit of flex in that, but it's, it's the basics there. And then I've started sort of itemizing what it looks like we'll get to in each section. And so as we move further along, that'll be updated. Um, so your choice of do it now while I'm talking or do it on your own or skip around, what you, whatever you want to do. Um, I'm not John Cogswell. I never will be. I'm a fan of his. I've taken a lot of his classes um, and I will sometimes quote things that he's taught me. I have probably this thick of a stack of notes that I've taken through the years of, of his uh, materials um, on top of the book. Uh, so some of what I say will be things that I've heard him say related to other projects that feel relevant um, to what we're doing in the moment. Um, 
This is not a replacement for buying his book. If you, if you don't have a copy, please go get one. Um, one, it supports the artist, and two, it's a phenomenal book to have on your shelves. Um, let's see. The I did manage to get the session one video up on YouTube, so if you didn't get that, um, you can get the link to it, and uh, then um, we will uh, make that available. I'll try to make the others available as quickly as I can. I can't guarantee with my work schedule that I'll have them available before the next session every time, um, but I'll do my best. Um, and at the last 15 minutes of every session, we will stop what I'm doing and have sort of a round robin for if you want to show things you've been working on, or if you want to, um, if you want to uh, ask questions about something you're stuck on or want to have ideas on a on design or a project, whatever, it's your time to show and, and tell, basically. Um, any questions about any of that? Yes, Miss Rachel, can you? Thank you to whoever put up the Facebook. Can you? Did I hear somebody can asking? Um, uh, can you hear me? Not very well. Can you get any closer to your mic? I was wondering, can you pin yourself? Because right now you're on gallery view, so I won't be able to. Yes, see thank you for. I will pin myself. Thank you for that. But I still can barely hear you. Am I the only one having trouble? No, I can yes. hardly hear her either. Okay, so that okay, I think so you, you may have your mic to... down or muted or covered with something a little bit. Okay, how about now? Can you hear me now? It's not getting better. Okay, so I'm just going to have to see if I can look at my computer. Um, okay. Did you have another question? Well, I'm new and I'm going to be maybe following along. I've been trying to go through your notes and everything and I downloaded what you put on the guides. Okay. But I haven't really bought anything. I was going through all the stuff that I had. So I think I'm gonna be doing more of the following if that's okay. And how should we call you, Miss Rachel? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Just call me Rachel if you have a question. Um, I can. I don't answer to Fred very often, but you know, you can try that. <laughs> um, <laughs> In terms of materials, it is one where you, a lot of times you'll want to decide for yourself what's appropriate to any given project. So uh, you don't have to have the exact same materials I do, or hell, you can work in copper if you want, or I, I don't recommend working in brass. It's pretty frustrating to try and set brass, um, uh, but work in whatever works for you for the projects. Um, I'm going to always try to tell you what I'm working on in advance of it going forward. I couldn't do that for the first session because I hadn't gotten in communication with all of y'all. So at your own pace and, and work at different paces, some things I may get frustrated with and want to do a second time, um, like emerald cut settings, which I always have a problem with. Um, but yeah, so, and, and also don't be afraid to say, hey, why are you doing it with that material? Or, you know, what, it, what is the difference between using that and something else? Um, some people may be working in Argentium or something completely different. Okay, I'm so. sorry. Did you did you pin yourself or I, did I not pin? Am I not showing up big? No. Oh, and pin her, Carmen. Myself. Hang on, Just let me spotlight. Find Rachel's picture in the gallery and then right click with your mouse and you should see pin okay, see come up it. there so you can pin her. I think Rachel, what you need to do is spotlight yourself rather yep. than pin yourself. So that's yep, I just different. switched it. Sorry, I grabbed the wrong one on the drop down. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is that good for everybody now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Rachel, I one thing. I don't know if anyone else has had this problem, but um I tried to join the Facebook group and never got anything back saying that I was accepted and I just went on it just now and it still said join the Facebook group. Hmm, so okay. I don't know what the if it's my end that I'm screwing up or if it's something's happening in between. But so I just you thought do have to answer the questions before it'll tell me that you're there. Yep. Um, and I've been checking it pretty steadily. So if it, it may be worth just trying again, um, yeah. unless it's not letting you try a second time. Um, I'll try it again right now. I mean, okay. I just and tried it. have it set to only accept people's profiles and not like group or page profiles. Oh, no, it's it's a person. Okay. I'm, but just thought I'd mention it in case anyone else was having trouble. Okay, I'll take a look at, at the after the session and make sure that I've approved everybody that showed up, but I've been pretty good about getting it within a few hours of seeing somebody. Any other questions while we're out there? 
What What is the name of the Facebook? It's Eclectic Facebook Nature group. Jewelry Design, all one word, mm -hmm. but it's yes. set to private. So you're going to want to follow the link that's in the chat. Eclectic Jewelry Design? Yeah, there's a, there's a link in the chat if you take a peek. Because it's uh, eclectic <laughs> always trips people up for spelling. If I could go back in time, I would change my company well, name. This is a lot of blah, blah, blah. I just want to get the guts of it. Yeah. Pardon? Was there a question? No? Okay. So with that in mind, I think that was all I want to make sure I cover to begin with. Um, no. A lot of it's like, there's a lot of people and they ask dumb questions. So I just want to- Whoever's just, talking, could you mute please? I'm just gonna mute a few people just in case. So um, unmute yourself when you're, when you're asking something specific, um, but otherwise uh, like don't hesitate to pop up. Just if you've got background noises, please do be aware of everyone else in the group. Okay, so um, we left off uh, working on the um, heavy gauge uh, bezel for um, just a, a basic, what, what John calls a basic bezel. Okay, so I was making this out of 18 gauge and uh, having previously done a simpler bezel and I think this was 22 gauge, I'd have to check this my notes. Volunteering to do all this. Stuff, you know, so it's Somebody nice. is still not on mute. If there's anybody who can tell me who, that'd be great. Just trying to see what we've got. Anita, Anita up at the top. Anita up at the top. Thank you. All right. Zoom does not want to respond when I try to mute, so bear with me. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Rachel, do you, are you on a page, a certain page, or are you just? Uh, I'm just giving a review of where we were. We have done roughly to page uh, 44 ish, 44, 45. Um, and if you weren't here for the last session, you may want to just review uh, chapters one and two on your own time. Um, and we talked a little bit about how to look at your stones a little more carefully and pick the stones, decide which ones are worth putting in what settings. Um, so we did a basic bezel, which um, we did uh, on a round stone, round cabochon, out of 22 gauge. And um, we pierced out the back on the last session. A um, little bit of sanding on that. It needs putting on something and finished polish and so on. Um, and then started the heavier gauge bezel which we did out of, in this case, I was doing it out of 18 uh, gauge sterling silver. Um, we sawed out the strip at the roughly uh, one quarter mark, because as John points out, you wanna be between a quarter and a third of the height of the stone. Um, but with a heavier bezel that can be down towards the smaller size. And uh, with a taller, with a, a lighter weight, you may wanna go a little higher up the curve. So this is a very snug fit when we're doing this heavy gauge. And um, I got as far as soldering it and doing a little bit of shaping and sizing. Um, I'm gonna remind you that uh, John is a, in favor in the book of, of sizing up, you know, always make it smaller rather than larger if you're gonna err on the side of not perfect. Um, and that he's using either half round or, um, or round flat pliers to do the sizing by squeezing at, with the curved side of the device on the interior. So we're, we're squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. I'm just doing a few at a time and flipping it over because if you do not flip it and do the squeeze on the opposite side, you're going to be stretching one edge more than the other. So your, your bezel will start to do this. If you squeeze on both sides, you'll be in good shape because it'll line up. It'll keep stretching the same on the top and the bottom. So that's super critical that you're doing one squeeze from this side and one squeeze from the other side um, in order to make your size up be consistent. And it sizes faster than you would think. 
The reason I'm emphasizing this is in our next bezel that we'll move to, that becomes really critical when we're making the interior step bezel, um, the interior ring of the step rather. So I've got this sized very snugly because the setting approach to this is gonna be one where we are compressing the material downward and inward. There's some really great drawings in the book about that. Um, and the other thing that we're gonna do is uh, file down the um, upper lip of it because um, it's now it's pretty well sized because I sized it well out of the gate. I've sanded it down on one of the sanding boards that John recommends, which is again, a piece of plexiglass. I've made mine as one giant board because I happen to have a big old plexiglass piece and I've got it set with different sizes. So I go from my 320, 400, 600, 1000 so that I can just work my way through it. John likes a, or recommends in the book anyway, a wet dry sandpaper. So you can, I just have a little thing of water that I'm dipping it in to do my, my sanding work. Another important thing is that I have done a little bit of cleanup of the interior seam. For that, I personally use a crossing file, but you could also use a half round to follow the curve. But John explicitly says, do not clean up the exterior. Um, in that regard, that's because if we put so too much heat on it, we want to have the solder lump there to be able to reflow. If we file it all clean at this stage of the game, it may create that little divot that we sometimes get if we overflow our solder. So he's leaving anything that is not critical, anything that you can get to later, that's the real rule, till later to, to sand and file. So we're not touching the outside seam. Um, so I've got my sanding done, but the next thing that I need to do is remember which side is my top, which I personally always forget when I'm in the middle of teaching to mark it properly. Let me make sure I got the right side that I want. And another important thing is I have a penchant for putting my bezel down onto my stone. Just make sure that it can get out through the top. Because if you haven't got a perfectly straight wall and you go out through the bottom to get it out, it may not be big enough at the top to actually move the stone into when you position it later. So I'm gonna, just gonna put a Sharpie mark along the top edge so I remember which one I'm doing as the top. And um, so on, let me see what page he's on that he talks about the filing technique. So I, talk, I pointed this out last time, but on page 47 in the book, he has a really important diagram that does not entirely show, it doesn't express what it shows. Um, it, meaning it, the taper, I wanna point out to you that his taper that he's putting on the top edge is not all the way to a point. This was a, this was a revelation to me. So I'm not doing, when I file this, I'm not gonna file it like this. I'm gonna file it so that it's like that, okay? This part is really important to the setting part portion of the project because we're eventually gonna use, um, per his setting techniques for a heavy bezel, we're gonna eventually use a downward force that will push this in. And if we have a sharp, thin um, point, that won't give us any leverage for that. So I'm about to start um, filing that down. I can figure out where I put my pen cap. Right. Oh, there it is. I'm about to start filing that beveled edge. And I'm just using a, um, I like to use a, a crossing file for just about everything that's on an outer curve. So make sure I can be seen in screen. And I'm just taking it down at an angle all the way around. So all these years I have been filing all the way up to a point, thinking that the goal was to get it thin enough to really give it easy pushover. And in reading through the book with care and noticing that diagram, I realized I'd been over filing. So I'm just doing a single pass all the way around the top. 
and then I'm going to keep going to get it to the angle that I really want. And you don't have to hold this up in the air, you can support it. I tend to have a mix of, you know, I, I'm nearsighted, so I like to be up close to my work, but if I get too close to it, my head will be in your way. Um, so support it however you want, or if you need to even put it in a, um, a ring clamp or something, just be aware that you may, in the course of holding it, you may be changing and distorting your shape. So if you're doing any of this kind of filing, make sure that you are um, reshaping it before you solder it down. So one of the reasons I don't care for a ring mandrel is that I have to keep repositioning it. I'm gonna just hold it in my hands. You could use a flat file for this. You could use a barrette. Um, I just, one of the reasons I like the crossing file is that it has a very um, narrow focus for when it touches down on whatever you're working on. Meaning like I'll often, if I'm using a big wide flat file, I'll often over file something because I'm not aware that I'm hitting a curve. Um, so I want something that has a very controlled coverage. Um, I'm a big proponent of file back and forth if it's more comfortable for you. Somebody did a really cool video recently where he made a machine to test the long-held belief of many jewelers that you should only file in one direction. Um, I didn't need that video. I'm of the opinion that if it's going to reduce your hand stress to file back and forth, an extra year of life off the life of the file is, uh, is worth keeping your hands in better shape. This is not coming down very quickly, so I may switch over to my barrette file. Just to get me a little bit more surface. I just have to watch my curves. Let's take the material down a little faster. And I'm watching to make sure that I'm not getting too steep a point. I don't tend to do a whole lot of heavy bezel work. I like the look of it. Um, I just don't always have the hand strength. Um, so if you have the hand strength or if you have a, a micro motor or hammer hand piece or something, or if you're really good at doing hand hammered setting, which we'll get to eventually, um, then, and you like the look of the heavy bezels, more power to you, go for it. Part of it is that I'm finding I'm getting less and less hand strength as the years go by. So we're getting there, but I think I wanna get a little bit more all the way around. So I'm gonna go change my direction a little bit. Personally, I sort of feel that watching somebody else file is about the same as watching paint dry. So if you have questions, feel free to pipe up. Rachel, do you ever use your um, dividers to mark that third? You absolutely could, but this lip is so narrow because what we're doing is um, a third of the, the thickness of the material. And it's so narrow that I'm, I'm better off eyeballing it personally. If you want to mark it, absolutely go ahead and mark it. Get a, get a meticulous guide. Um, I'll reiterate for those that weren't here that my take on this is take as many classes from as many different instructors as you possibly can in your lifetime. 
Everybody has different ways of doing things. And um, you'll create your own amalgam of what they're teaching. Um, in this case, this project is about John's technique. So I'm trying very hard to use his approach, even if I would normally do something differently. Um, because my exercise is to be learning from John even when um, he's not the one teaching me directly. So they were getting down to a nice evenish little ring, a couple spots that could use some cleanup, but I'm not taking the full lip down. I don't know if that's even remotely going to be big enough to show. So let me get some black paper behind me and help make that help. So there's a little bit of a lip. Is that showing at all on screen? It's kind of out of focus. Um, but basically I've built that angle that he shows on page 47 in the right-hand section while still leaving a nice flat top on it. I can even touch up my flat top a little bit by just running it across my sandpaper briefly so that we can see the top line. I've got a nice clean finish. And I'm gonna, because I've been handling it, I'm gonna double check my fit before I go on to setting it down. And it is definitely a little bit snug, but for a heavy bezel, that's what we want. I may have it just the wrong direction. Yep, I had it the wrong direction. So it, I've got a good clean fit. I've got a good uh, flat surface on my back plate and I've already trimmed away my angle. So I'm going to take, this is an 18 gauge bezel. I don't ever really want to do an 18 gauge back on anything. That's a lot of weight that I don't need for the support for such a small stone. So I'm going to try this on a 22 gauge back. Um, and uh, another benefit is I can just cut a piece off with shears and pat it down. I just got a basic steel block that I'm flattening my back plate on. Um, this would be a good time to remember to put your maker's mark on it if you were going to uh, do that. But you may also be cutting away per the ideas that John has about not leaving a back completely whole so that it doesn't gather bad material, you know, water and other and sweat and things like that. I'm going to switch gears over to the soldering station. Any questions so far? Okay. How are we doing for focus? Do we want to be a little closer or that's still that's good. That good? That's yeah, better. There we go. Hi. I have a quick question before sure. you start. Uh, yep. I'm, I was wondering if, um, because you beveled that edge already before you set the stone, how, is it going to make it difficult to set the stone in it? and set it once you do that? So it's actually supposed to help um, because we're beveling the outside edge of it. And because oh. I'm, not bevel I'm not filing up to a sharp, sharp point, right. uh, it's not becoming a lip inside of the bezel. Okay, okay. that's what I think I was thinking. Yeah, have, but, okay. yeah. so that's actually kind of important um, in, in, and, and why he says not to do that um, because it's, it need, it'll thin the metal too much so it won't set well. So this right. is about having sized it to the right height for the stone. Okay. Um, and it is a little weird. I mean, you could technically, if you, were, if you were cutting away all your back plate and so on, you could do that filing after you've soldered it down. But right. if you think about it, let's say you're putting it on a larger pendant or something, it's going to be really hard to get your file in to get the angle you need after you've soldered it down. So it makes a lot of sense to have done it at this stage. Okay. Yeah. It's Thank just you. a little trickier to get the right height, especially if you have a stone that's not relatively equidistant in or equal mm -hmm. height, whatever that would be. Um, I'm using a blend of uh, paste solder, I mean, paste flux and uh, a Prips flux just to keep the oxidation down. Um, and for those of you that weren't here last time, I'm working with a basic Smith air acetylene torch. I tend to do most of my work on a number one tip. And per John's request, we're using hard solder to put this down, which is not 
always the most comfortable thing. I gotta switch to goggles, bear with me a moment. If I were not on a uh, uh, microphone, I would have my vent system on, but it'd be hard for you guys to hear me when that's going full blast. Um, in this case, I'm using um, little bits of wire solder. And John talks in the book about there are various ways that you can position this, depending on which part of the bezel is most likely to show any solder work. And in his annoying way, when you ask him, how much solder should I use? He says, enough. Thanks, John. <laughs> so um, I'm heating the back plate because as we know, solder follows the heat which does not mean it's following the torch. It means it's following where the metal is getting hottest. And my risk in using hot, hard solder to put this down to the back plate is that I may open up my seam, but every time you flow solder, a little bit of the um, non-primary metal stuff moves out of the solder. So it becomes a degree or two more that is needed to reflow it. So I'm just getting my back plate going. If your solder's flowing up the sidewalls, it means your walls are getting hot faster than your back plate is. I do not have quite enough solder to go around. Come on, little guy. There we go. Um, the spot that most people have trouble with if it opens back up is going to be the seam. And I had a little bit of opening, so I'm going to touch that up with a tiny bit of solder. And there. Okay, give it a few moments to cool. I quench in water, and I'm going to toss that in the pickle. Um, where I will discover that I have a little bit more opening on my seam than I wanted because I overheated by a moment. So I'll have to decide if it's manageable or not. Rachel? Yeah, question? Did, did you say you saw, well, first of all, you soldered the bezel with medium and the back plate? No, I used hard because I would normally use medium, but John is asking us to use hard solder for our seam and for putting it down to the back plate. Um, he writes that he uses uh, hard solder as much as possible so that he can use easy solder to connect it, um, which also makes for easier repairs if somebody brings a piece of your jewelry to another jeweler. Your bezel isn't gonna come apart, but it's easier to take off of a ring and say resize the ring or something. Okay. If it's not, hard if you don't solder. do well with using hard solder for both of them, there's no shame in using hard solder for your seam and then going to medium for putting it down to the back plate. Um, but as you get better and better at controlling your heat, remember that you'll have more situations where there's more than, say, three solders that you have to do. So you may need to use the same level of solder for more than one thing. That's all about planning the order of, of when you do what. Okay, thank you. That answer enough? Rachel, I'm so surprised that you're using a number one tip. Why? Because it seems like it would be too hot. So it's not, that's not all that does the heat. And in point of fact, a lot of what John does, he does even with a, sometimes with a two or even bigger because he's doing a lot of big so silver work. The, remember that the flame, oops, I'm, you're not seeing the right camera. Remember that the flame can be bushier and broader when you've got the bigger tip. So it's going to spread the heat more than say a focused small flame. So um, because our goal is to get the plate hot, we want broad heat because it's a broader piece. Um, yeah, John, John gave a description of the physics of the torch, the first class that I took from him that just blew my mind. Um, about the compo the pieces, the segments of the torch flame. Uh, and, and it just, like, you have to really think about what the, what the effect is and how bushy your flame is relative to what you're doing. So in this case, we want a soft, bushy flame instead of a focus. Now it's different if you're working with gold, but in silver, it needs that broad heat. Any other questions while we wait for that to come out of the pickle? 
Well, why don't you comment on the gold then while you're waiting for that? Because uh, so I, I am not a gold expert. I am a gold okay. dabbler. <laughs> and there may be other folks who have strong opinions, but it's the, the base premise is about how the heat is transferred. So when you're working on the same bezels in gold, whereas in silver, John writes about us working the back of the silver of the, of the ring to get it to close together, the heat doesn't transfer in the same way. So with gold, you're focusing your heat on the seam or thereabouts, and it doesn't do you as much good. If somebody can express that better, I would love to hear it. I can't afford to work in gold enough to get as proficient with it as I have in silver. <laughs> Anybody have thoughts on gold? Okay, well, play around with it if you can afford to play around with it. On, on gold, I would probably be using the smaller torches is the thing, because I'm concentrating my heat instead of bushying it. Um, okay, so while that is pickling, before we go back and because then again, you're just gonna be sitting me, watching me sand and saw and file again, let's talk about the setting tools. I'm not gonna be doing setting right away because I'm making these as a sampler and I'm gonna make a few of the different settings for the same stones over the course of this. So by the end of three, I'll probably do a session of setting stones so that we can go over the techniques he uses. But if you wanna start setting with some of his tools, let's talk about the various things he suggests making and the ones that you can buy um, because he's a big fan of modifying things. So if you go to your auto fries or your Rios of the world and you buy a bezel pusher, okay, um, they're going to come in with very sharp, cut, clean edges. Um, and the, the first thing that I always do is blunt my corners and my edges down a little bit. And I polish them on a cutting compound. Um, just to, so that because if I'm if I'm a little bit off on my setting, if I angle my piece ever so slightly, and I have those sharp corners, I am I personally knock into everything. John doesn't talk much about cornering, but he does. When you watch him prep a tool, he does sort of just do it by the way he files. So he files things a little bit smooth. But the piece that he does that blew my mind is on the end of this. Once you've got it blunted, he takes a file and just goes. Beep. Dip, dip to the end of it a little bit and coarsens it up. I had been always taught that you high polish these things because any mark on it is going to potentially transfer. But just that act of putting a couple little passes into it has changed how much the grip is. So one of the reasons we scratch our stones is we go slipping across, right? That having a little tiny, tiny bit of grip that you're then going to buff out if it makes a mark using either files or, or sanding equipment, or he uses the um, felt buff wheels on his Fordham. Um, that, that little bit of grip makes all the difference in the world. Um, he also is talking in the book about making tools out of several things. These are my choice in it. He uses 16 penny nails as the basics or brass rod, okay? Um, I just picked up a bunch of different sizes of, what is this, four inch brass rod as a set out of from Amazon just to play around with it because I don't have any brass setting tools. Um, and on these, I just took a planishing hammer or you could take your ball peen hammer. Um, it's just more likely to be mucked up and you want a fairly clean fit. And so I took the rounded end and I just pounded it down. I'm gonna get at least two setting tools out of this. Move it in the frame, Rachel. Oh, sorry. Uh, I got to move my camera. Apologies. So I'm just pounding it down from two sides because John is recommending that we go with a sort of a rectangular shape. Um, so just flattening two walls of it and then taking a, uh, a not very high quality file. I'm taking the corners and the edges off. Um, if you're working with a nail, please, please, please do yourself a favor and clean your bench and put a piece of paper down and do all of your filing over that and then get rid of the filings because you don't want 
the stuff that comes in a nail to be mixed in with your silver strap. Like there's tin, uh, if they're galvanized nails, there's tin on there and stuff and you wanna keep it out of there. Um, so with the brass, it's not as big a deal. So I'm just blunting it a little bit and giving myself a smooth top from whatever's left over from the manufacturer's cut on that. So that I have a little bit of a rectangular flat surface just with edges taken down. This one I did a little bit more too the other day. Um, and so I'm gonna, I can just saw this in half and um, I may try to make a little bit of a point um, so that I have something to start hammering it into a handle. Um, but that's, I'm, I'm looking forward to using this. That feels softer and smoother than the steel tools. So I'll be interested to see how it compares for setting. And I may try it a few different sizes of this. He talks a lot about how people who are doing a lot of stone setting are going to make a whole array of these. But the thing that he describes most in the book is making one out of a basic nail. Um, I didn't have a 16 penny. I think this is a 12 penny or something like that. I can't remember. Um, and the nice thing about it is it comes with the point to help put it in there. I also like using those, um, uh, uh, I called them flooring nails last time by accident, but they are actually um, mason, masonry nails. Um, and I like them because they're already hardened steel and they aren't galvanized. The galvanic stuff, you don't want to have to heat in any way. So these, you can do whatever you want with them. Make I'm going to make a, a, a setting punch out of one of them. I'm going to make one of these regular setting uh, bezel pushers out of it. But for the sake of his exercise, all we need is one of the handles, whichever is most comfortable in your hands, okay? And it should have the metal ring, which helps if the thing splits on you, it's less likely to send something through your hand. Um, and you're gonna pre-drill with a drill bit that is a little bit smaller than the size of your nail, than the, than the diameter of your nail. So let me get my shaft and bit in place. Um, and you're doing that so that it won't split the wood as it goes in and it gives it a little channel to go into. Just gotta find the right size drill bit. So when we're talking about this, this is on page, let's see, where did he make these? He is on page 53 is where he describes making these. I have a quick question. Are we going to be doing both um, like hammer setting and push hand push setting with these tools or are we only going to be pushing with our hands or? So the answer is all of the above, except that you're not going to hammer set with anything that has a wood handle. You're going to hammer set with something like a, a hammer punch of some kind. So that's okay. why I'm personally making one out of this. You can also make it out. He has directions for making one out of a um, square steel rod, which I'll get you. I'll show you what I got for that. Awesome. So the answer is, depending on the stone you're doing, you can do hand hammer settings. You can do, if you have a hammer hand piece, you can do that. This is the, this is the size of rod that he references that he uses as a starting point if you're doing a um, punch, a setting punch. You can also buy setting punches or modify other tools like uh, chasing and repoussé tools often have a good item for, for doing that setting. Um, I certainly don't have the hand strength to hand, you know, push and set the, um, the heavier gauge, the 18 gauge bezel. So it's gonna have to be at least hammered, hand hammered. Um, or I might, if I don't have the strength for that, then I may have to go to a hammer hand piece. That answer the question? Yep, absolutely. And and that's good. I was looking at the variety of different things and I'm like, well, that should be with a hammer and that should be with out a hammer. So yeah, just for my own brain. Thank you. Yeah. One tool that Sean John doesn't use in his list of tools is um, the kind of bezel pusher that has a prong slot for it, which I personally love when I'm setting prong settings. Um, so I'm a little surprised by that. Um, he just uses a bezel pusher 
a normal bezel pusher. Um, and I grew up first learning about bezel rockers, which I hate um, because I really slip a lot when I'm using a bezel rocker, but he doesn't do a lot with those. Okay, so I'm just doing a quick centered drill hole. If I can find my Fordham pedal stashed away over here. So I'm just drilling down about an inch or so. to get myself a starter hole. And then I'm going to hammer in point side down, straight in. And again, keep using 16 penny. Uh, get my bench clear so that I do not get galvanized material mixed in putting a piece of paper down, and then I'm going to saw off the end. Get rid of those scraps, not in my silver pile. Hang on. And again, not using your good file, but whatever you got that's kind of cruddy, filing down to create, in his recommendation, he's doing a rectangular top to these. Oops, getting under there for more dust. So I'm just flattening on two sides. You may find that you get the little magnetic bits coming off of this. And then I'm flattening the top and I'm blunting the corners a little bit, just very lightly and the edges so I don't get sharp points. And then the last thing that he does is he does that tap, tap, tap of the to give it a little bit of a roughness. Um, I tend to want to go in, I want to run this over the, um, over my uh, wheel with a cutting compound. I use Tripoli, you can use Graystar, any of those cutting compounds. Um, and then I'll come back and do that tap again. I just don't like, I don't have enough control to like having the sharp corners. So I just want to blunt it down. I'm going to scooch over to my darkened, polishing station for just a second. It's not a big uh, amount of cleanup, it's just getting the roughness off. So I would go scrub these before I'd use them because I don't want that gunk all over my gear. But that gives us one quick setting tool with what about $4 worth of handle and a single nail um, or with a piece of rod that I could cut off. I would put a point on the end that I've cut just so that I have something to really grab when I'm hammering. But the setting of it is the same thing. And this is a nice solid tool. Um, he talks about the length on these being between two and a half and three inches usually. But when we get to the set in to the section in, I think it's chapter five on setting your gravers, he talks about sizing hand related tools like this, where you're going to often be crunching your hand by um, putting a pen or pencil in the soft palm of your hand and then holding 
the width at the where you would pinch it together at the top. I'm doing a really bad job of showing you guys this. So you're holding it. That is the distance that you want in total for a well fitted graver. It's similar for the um, setting for if you want to, if you have very small or very large hands, you're going to want one that fits similarly. So you see, when I have this in my hand, it comes to just about that point that I would pinch at, giving me the most control. Because if I have it much longer, I'm going to have less control. I won't be holding the ball of it while I'm doing my setting. There'll be a lot of excess hanging off. Did that make any sense at all? I'm describing that very poorly. But again, it's just put a pencil or something in the squishy part where your palm gets. Hold on to the where it pinches, where you've got it held. And that's the position, that's the max length that you want by the time you're done. So that the total length, once it's in a handle, should be the length that you've got there. Hopefully that gives you enough to get a sense in there. I think he's written that up in chapter five, the, the sizing part um for at least for the gravers for when we're when we're when we get to that stage and we're creating all of our handled gravers questions i have a question about when you use the file i can barely hear whoever's talking i'm sorry okay it's it's me again i guess you can't hear me um i was just wondering I've been told in the past that when you use a file, you should never use it on steel and then use it on your work. Do you keep it separated? So that's what I, why I was taking the dust away. And thank you. That reminds me, I need to clean my bench pin of dust. Um, different people have different opinions on that. It's, it's going to be about the kind of steel you're filing and so on and how well you clean your files. Um, I wouldn't go straight from one to the other. I would use a, a file comb on my files before going back to the silver, personally. But I don't know, do other people have thoughts on that? Do you have completely separate files for your, for your steel or do you clean between? I'm I seeing Marie Helene nodding. All right, is that a you have separate files? I use separate files for it. Separate files, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just about not getting the, the material that comes off of the file mixed in with your silver. When it's when it's straight up steel, you should be able to grab a magnet and run it through your filings. Um, in this case, it's the extra the galvanized stuff, the tin. I don't think is magnetic, so I'm worried about that getting stuck in with everything else. Other questions or feedback or comments? Um, um, I had a question about, I forgot to ask you earlier. You said you use flux and pace. Is I use what and what? Flux and pace. Fl oh, pace, solder. flux, and uh, so I'm using a, what am I using? Is it Crips? No, it's Griff Flux. I'm using Griff Flux, but any good paste flux will do because I like its stickiness factor. It helps hold things down. And I'm using, in this case, a blend of uh, actual prips and homemade prips. Um, I have John's recipe for making prips flux. Um, and this is good for helping with the oxidation and tarnish factor. So I really should have put the one down, heated, put the one down, then put the other one down. Um, but I was talking through it and didn't, didn't do that in the right order. Um, you can use either or both as you see fit. I, a lot of people use just prips, but it doesn't have any glue factor to it. And I, a lot of what I do, I count on that glue factor to mark things out for me and hold, hold things in place. Um, I think that John uses primarily uh, paste flux, but he also, when he's working big on his projects, not just samples, he also does a full borax alcohol dip every time. Like if he's making a chalice or something, he's dipping it or brushing it and burning off the uh, alcohol every single time. And I don't like having the borax alcohol mix on my bench because I'm too clumsy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? 
Okay, so we're not going to dive into the actual setting other than I want to point out a couple things in case you are diving into your settings. Um, I, on page 54, oh, on 54, he also has the, uh, how the, the dimensions of a setting punch. Um, but one of the most important things that he has, has as his order of operations that I have not been taught elsewhere is when you're working on the north, south, east, west setting of the starting of your setting, he starts on the seam. And his reasoning for that is that it's the softest the seam will be at any point in its life because we're compressing it. So if we don't start on the seam, we're just going to make things harder and harder. Um, so he's basically arguing in favor of, especially on like an oval stone, make sure that your seam is pretty much centered along your longest wall. Um, so that note is uh, middle of the second column on page 54. Um, and that was a really neat thing to understand why he chooses that position. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, it, it'll be interesting, he says something that counters that when we get to the square settings in a little bit. Um, but just note that. And also on page 57, note that if you are going to use the barrette file um, for doing your finishing, that he encourages us to um, sand down the edges of the barrette. So I tend to sand down, excuse me, I've got the hiccups. Um, I tend to sand down uh, my um, my needle files right away. Um, you just want the edge that it comes with naturally, which may be a little rough, to be blunted down and smooth because otherwise it's scraping up against things. So when he's showing you how to finish um, the, the upper edge of these heavier bezels, you're often scraping right against or brushing right, right against the stone itself as you clean up the top edge, that lip that we created by doing the filing. And so having your ed if the edges of your files blunted is important so that they don't the steel doesn't scratch your stone. Uh, and that can, can include not just sanding, but if you need to run it along your um, polishing cutting wheel, just be careful not to gum up the actual teeth of the file. Um, but this, this steel is such that if you do it right, you can really get a super, super smooth polish on your steel. So this is, this is a modified file that uh, Charles Luton Brain showed me how to do, except I've broken off the tip because it was so fine. Um, just to get into small spaces without scratching. So it's for doing like insides of box clasps and things like that when you need to clean something up. But you can, you can safely grind down and sand down and file down and then polish your steel tools in ways. So don't be afraid to modify them. Although if it's your favorite, you may want to buy a separate one. <laughs> so you're not modifying your best one and then find you've done it wrong. So those are the notes I want to have in your mind when you're looking at the actual setting, if you're getting ahead of me. Um, if you're looking to do the bright cutting that he talks about on page 59, that's going to be your number 42 flat graver. Um, and you'll want to read ahead to chapter five on the... Um, the preparation so that you're putting your, your uh, graver into your handle. We're going to do that when we get to the graver settings chapter. Um, and so then it's just if you want to get ahead and be working on bright cuts on your own stones in the meantime. Questions? No, but I have a comment I, on page 58 yep. where, where it talks about the burnishing. I just had to chuckle while I was reading it because he was using spit saliva. <laughs> yeah, to make, to make the file go across or the um, burnisher go across smoothly. So he also uses it on a saw blade, and I, it's one of the first things I was taught too. It is actually better lubricant. It doesn't clog up your teeth, your 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 saw teeth. Um, obviously, you don't want to put it on a shared blade if you're working in a shared studio and you don't want to put it on the front. This is the thing that in my intro classes I have to teach them. Wax goes on the front, spit goes on the back of the saw blade so you're not cutting your finger when you put it on there. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that I got a bottle of the wintergreen oil because I'm trying to try the John things. Before I saw later in the book 
that he said, but I hate wintergreen, so I don't use it. So, and I opened the bottle, the container, and boy, I do not think I'll be opening the bottle. So if you haven't rushed out to get yourself wintergreen oil, you may want to smell it in the store before you do to see if you can put up with it. Because I think he goes on to say he uses either linseed oil or something else in lieu of that um, when he's doing stuff with bits in his, in his work. Any other fun bits that anybody found in this section? Okay, uh, how are we doing for time? Um, I'm gonna pull out of the pickle the heavy gauge bezel and do some trimming. Right back, just a second. That pickle is not hot. I turned that on. Okay, um, he does do a brass brushing. So I'm just doing a quick brass brushing after I'm taking it out. Um, it didn't get fully cleaned up because my pickle wasn't hot, but I'm just taking off that skim coat. And I'm now going to um, trim this up and I could choose to do a pierced design um, for expediency's sake. I think I'm just going to do what I did on the other one and trim out a nice hole in the center, hopefully a little neater than I did before. Um, the bottom plate being 22 gauge, if my hand strength is up to it, I can trim. So I tend to do that on the outer layer for speed. Uh, for those of you that won't, won't, weren't here last time, I mentioned that whenever possible, I'm a lazy jeweler. I would rather spend my time designing and doing the fun stuff than doing the tedious stuff. So 22 gauge, this is just a pair of uh, bonsai shears that I love. Um, and then for the sake of neatness, when I'm doing something like this, I'm going to sharpie down, fill that all in, except for that my piece is still a little wet, so it doesn't want to take that. And I'm going to use my, um, dividers to tell me how much of a wall I want. So I don't need much to hold the stone, but I also, he talks in the first chapter about considering whether the back of the stone is finished or not. This is actually really nicely polished. So it might be worth putting in a pattern. Um, so I'm just gonna make oop, a very messy. guideline. And then I'm going to uh, put a quick drill hole in here. Um, recommended that you do a bit of a divot with your punch first and that it not be smack dab in the middle of everything or on a corner. About that. I don't know what happened. Must have had an internet drop. Let me spotlight myself again. Okay. When did you lo lose me? Was I, was I making marks in the bottom of the bezel? I think, I think we were talking was... about, go okay. ahead. We were talking about saliva. <laughs> oh, okay, that far back, goodness. Um, yes. <laughs> all right, so yes, we were talking about saliva and how John uses it um, on saw blades as well as his recommended section on using it for, uh, for the burnisher, which I have not actually tried it with the burnisher yet, but I also don't like the quality of burnisher I have. I need to get one new one. Um, okay, so what I was, doing for that whole time when I thought I was talking to you was I was marking out my uh, inner bezel wall, I mean, excuse me, inside the back plate for what I'm gonna pierce away. And um, also that uh, um, uh, we should be using a punch to start our drill position and that it should not be in the center somewhere, but should be um, off on one of the long edges or something like that, unless you're cutting a very specific pattern. So I'm just popping in a quick drill hole. I don't need anywhere near that size bit. 
Rachel, you're frozen again. Oh, no. Hang on. Can you hear me at least? Yes. Yep. Okay, let me see what's happening with my, maybe my internet is bad. Maybe. Can you hear me again? Yes. 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 All right. Hang on. I'm going to make Saren my co-host. So if I fail again, it doesn't screw things up too badly. Um, and I may have to like completely close out of my Zoom and come back in. I must be having internet connections issues, even though I'm not getting notice of that. So hang on. Uh, participants. Saren. Okay, and hopefully we didn't lose all of the chat and it looks like we're still recording. And spotlight, okay, am I back center? Can you see me? Yes. Okay, try this again, unless this is a cursed bezel, in which case it's kicking me out of the connection. Um, so what I was saying is that I have marked out what I'm gonna pierce away and I've punched a mark so that I'm not drilling with, uh, with no guide. And with a smaller bit than the one that I was just using for setting up my nail. Do this quick little drill. And then I'm going to pierce this out. And I don't, uh, I do want to mention, um, Alan was kind enough to bring something up, a good question that he's had me thinking about since last session on um, when I was doing the sanding and filing of the outer edges of this bezel, I was doing a somewhat odd, or the last bezel rather, I was doing a somewhat odd position of curving my hand as I did it, curving away. Um, and he said, isn't that a repetitive stress concern? The answer is probably yes, is my guess. But what I realized is I do so much action the other way when I'm filing that it actually felt kind of nice to be going in the opposite direction. Um, so I, my assumption is that any movement that we're doing as jewelers, whether it's filing or sawing or whatever, we're, we're doing things that are re potential repetitive stress injury issues. Um, if you're feeling that in your own hand, doctors see whether you need, um, you know, trigger finger surgery or carpal tunnel work or just physical therapy exercises. Um, there's a lot of great folks online who specialize in that. I wish I could remember the name of, there's one gal who specifically does exercises for jewelers. Um, so, do keep it in mind um, that if there's a position or an action that you're taking that's causing you pain, maybe don't do that action. It, um, and uh, for me, the, the, bit, the small amount of that kind of um, sanding that I do was not a problem. If anything, it felt like a good stretch counter to my normal filing. I'll show that again for good or for ill when we do the outside of this bezel. It's all well and good that I made this uh, mark for myself, but I'm not following it very well. So I'm gonna have a lot of filing on this one. Really not well. Let's go back and cut some more of that out. Okay. 
Okay, so I've got my basic back removal. I could take a lot more of that off if I wanted to. I'm gonna just see roughly what it looks like from behind. Okay, and I definitely need to neaten that up. I'm gonna have to file down um, all of my walls down to the basics. This is the one that I should have cleaned before I started using it. A sec. Um, and probably, I don't need to, I, uh, again, I'll ask, do you guys want to sit and watch me file and do all of these steps down or would you rather I move on to, um, uh, starting the step bezel, which is our next project, the, um, shoulder bezel. Because all that I have left on this one is cleanup, filing, sanding. And I would like to get shoulder bezel. I heard one vote for shoulder. Yeah, yeah but, let's go for shoulder. Okay. Yeah. Suzanne. Okay. Unless I hear strong objections, there is there are shots of me sanding and filing in the video from the first session. And I'll just show that action I was describing, which is when I'm doing the outsides, I'm doing, I'm rolling my piece. Let's see if I can get a good angle for you guys. So I'm doing a little bit of this, which is a downward curve. Whereas when I'm filing, I'm often going the other way. So again, if that's if that causes you distress, be aware of it and don't overdo it. Um, I like it because I feel like I'm following the curve when I do that. Uh, a lot of people like to use sanding sticks so that all of your work is up in the air or up in some kind of supported motion. Um, I have this really weird thing about uh, the, a lot of people make their sanding sticks out of um, paint sticks and that wood and the wood of popsicle sticks is like nails on a chalkboard to me. So I just can't hold on to it. Can't deal with it. <laughs> um, I'm looking to maybe make some out of plexiglass at some point because that seems like a good smooth al alternative. Okay. Any last questions about the basic bezel before we go into step bezel. I just have a comment about the sanding sticks. Yep. Um, you made something click in my head. So I took some of those nail files that some of the sides that I can't use. Yep. And I put uh, 1200 emery paper. I used my rhino glue and glued it on there. And it's the bomb. Nice. It's so much easier to use than a larger sanding stick. So yeah, or uh, um, carpet tape, double-sided carpet tape is another great way to stick things down. Um, and then, of course, what I did show last time is the uh, the flexible um, uh, nail files that I posted about. Um, I like the OP. 1,000 and 4,000 grit, and they come in other grits, but these don't necessarily have enough firmness for the heavy duty sanding and filing. They're sort of touch up finish ones. Yeah, yeah. I use the 3M sponges um, mm. a lot, but they're a little bit too floppy. But, um, the, you know, the nail files that are, um, that have sponge, not the ones that you just showed, but just kind of the real cheapo ones. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, glued the sandpaper on there and then trimmed it away and it's much easier on my hands than nice. say a painter's uh stick or you know how some people use that or even yeah. plexiglass because I've tried that and it was always cutting my hands what well glued? so plexiglass if you're going to get it you probably want to get um like tap plastics in Portland which is local to me um, they will edge your, your strips, whatever they've cut out for you. They can melt the edges a little bit so that they're a softer, not cutting your hands edge. Yeah. Um, I'm going to see if they can, they can do that for some strips for me. Um, what glue, what glue did you use to glue on that, to the nail file? I didn't, uh, they, that's the, that is, oh, what did. Oh, me? Uh, rhino glue, rhino. It's a uh, glue you can get off of Amazon, but I found that it's the, the best like super glue-ish kind of uh, glue if you want to nice. use it. Not for jeweler, jewelry glue, but if you want to tack something down or, you know, it burns off real easily too. So you can use it for, you know, putting two pieces of metal together to have, you know, mirror piercings. Uh, I use it for that. Um, but yeah, I like that. It's gel and it slides around and then it 
solidifies. So if anybody finds a, an Amazon link, feel free to toss it up in the in the chat. Um, okay, so let's talk uh, shoulder bezels or bearing bezels, but I've only ever known them as step bezels. I, I don't know that I've heard anybody else called them bearing bezels other than John. Um, what, what do you all know these by? Anyone? I've heard yep. of bearing bezels, yeah. I've heard bearing step. I've heard. Just yeah. step, yeah. Step. step, lots of steps. That's the best. So whatever they're called, I'm probably going to revert to step just because it's ingrained in me. So when I say step, I mean shoulder slash bearing bezel. Um, and the basics of these start out the way we did our basic bezel um, in that we're going to make an outer wall. Uh, and then it's uh, there's two variations that I'm going to go over today. One is with a an inner wall and one is with a um, inner ring made out of square wire. You could use round wire too, and John's got descriptions of both of those. Um, looking at what we're going to do, I want to point out one of the most important things on page 61, in which he encourages us to file down an angle to bevel the inner wall of the inside wall, the one that's going to be touching the outer wall. So you'll see he's done a little blow up image of it at the bottom of 61. And that holds true whether you're doing one of the wire rings or whether you're doing the wall. And the reason for that is it gives a little channel for our solder to flow into. If we do not do that step, it puts a lump of solder right where our, our stone is gonna be seated. So that's one of the most important things you can add to your practice. The other thing that I'll mention and didn't realize until I took his class in person is just how dead serious he is about a snug fit. And you'll see on page, where is it? Um, he's got a little shot uh, on page 62 of using a wooden tool to force the inner ring or wall into the outer ring or wall. It, it, if you're doing it right, it's tight enough that you actually need to hammer it into place. Um, because then what, what the goal is, is you end up, once soldered and filed, not being able to tell when you look at the back of your bezel where the back wall um, ends. Where, you know, it's going to be one solid wall, even though it's been made of two parts. So keep those two things in mind. And the reason that I say that is because we're going be, to be making our inner ring a little bit smaller than we expect and using that stretching technique with the pliers to get it to be really super snug. So snug that unless you've made the angled bevel on the what is going to be the outside of the inside ring, you're not going to even be able to get it to fit inside of it. It's that kind of snug. So you're going for no gapping at all in a well-made bezel in this process. Um, the other thing is that if you are new to doing faceted stones, this is the a great entry point. I encourage you to start with either an oval or a round. I find that oval stones are um, a little more forgiving if you're not as clean and straight with all of your lines. When there's a circle, the eye really sees it if you've got lumps and bumps and not everything flat and even and set the same way. Um, so I usually encourage people to start on an oval stone if you're going for your first faceted. Um, and we're gonna work through these in roughly what I consider to be easiest to hardest, which is how he's written them up in the book. Note that when we get to non-oval and rounds, there's going to be a third variation we're going to try, which is building the two-part wall into a strip before we make it into a ring. So the first two we're doing are building two pieces and putting them together. Then we move into some of the techniques where you actually make your step wall, which is something that you can buy pre-made from places like Rio and so on. It's just in limited sizes, so it's nice to be able to know how to make your own. Um, questions about any of those tidbits? All right, so I am going to pull over the two stones that I plan on working with today. Let's see. Okay, to that, we are still recording, yes. Oh, I already brought them over, where did I put them? 
here we go. So the two stones that I'm working with, I'm doing one faceted and one cabochon. I'm going to start with, which one did I intend to do first? The oval first, so that we can see a faceted stone. Um, I've already done one of my little charts for it, which I showed at the last session and which there's a template of if you want to make use of it. Um, so where's my template for this stone? This pair. There we go. So I've done my little mock-up with some of the data. I've uh, in inspected my stone, looking at how well it's cut. Um, on this particular stone, it'll be probably a little hard to see. Yeah, the scale's not going to be right for you guys to see it, but it has ever so slightly um, steeper cut on one side than the other. So I need to make sure that I'm aware of that and it's probably going to impact where everything sits to make sure it's level. Um, I've noted whether it has any flaws in it. I've designed a few different settings that are in the book that I might want to use this same stone for. Um, in this case, we're going to do the basic walled step bezel. So first things first, I'm making my exterior wall. In my case, I'm using 22 gauge. You can go heavier. John suggests that you aim for 24 gauge on the inside walls. Um, you don't, you don't want to go less than that. You can go more than that, but he says it's weight overkill. So give some thought to what works for you. Um, I know that I, when I'm working on just adding some gold elements to a design, if I can, if the interior bezel isn't going to show and it won't impact the color of the stone, I'll often make my inside wall in sterling if my outside wall is gold, but not if it's going to be seen in the design. Um, so with that in mind, I'm taking my calipers, which I have too many tools on my bench already. No such thing I know, but my calipers. And zeroing them. Double checking my measurements. Seven nine different than I got, so it might not be centered. So eleven point seven nine long. And remember that your stones, even if they're supposed to be round and well calibrated, are not always. So John encourages checking the stone in a couple of different spots make sure that it doesn't change dimensions, especially I find square stones that are supposed to be calibrated are often off by tiny amounts. And we're measuring it at the girdle on this one. So 8.8. Okay. So I need a strip for his approximations, 12, 24. So the last time we did the oval, um, it was a lot of overage of metal because it's not the same as, say, measuring a square. So if you're just adding up um, the length and the width and multiplying it by 3.5, which is what the number is he gives to give you enough spare, you end up with a little bit more extra than I feel you need. So I'm, I'm going to ballpark it. So 12, 20... about 60 millimeters. And again, math is not my friend. Rachel, you had 8.8 .8 and what was the other one measurement? 11.79. So yeah, I'm going to need a little bit more than 20, aren't I? I need 25, 26-ish. I'm so not doing that right. 20 plus the width, eight. 
when you get closer to 30. This is why I don't do the measurements. I take a piece of tape and figure it out. Can you hear me? Yep. Try adding the length and the width and dividing by two. Oh, thank you. I missed that step, didn't I? So I've got 12, 20, 20.5, 20 divide by two, 10.5, and, and then, then multiply by the 3.5. Is that the goal? Oh, well, I would use 3.14. Yeah, and, and John goes with that extra bit, um, which I'm with you, Alan. I go more towards, or if, was that Alan talking? I go more towards the use, the use pi when you got it. So 30. So yeah, we're getting about 35. Uh, uh, well, let's, let, let me just be clear. You, you need to account for the thickness of the metal. And by yeah. you... By using 3.5, you're doing that. If you're using 3.14, then you need to add the thickness of the metal before you multiply it by pi. Got it. And again, this is why I like to use a piece of yeah. tape. <laughs> um, so let me do it properly. I'll bring up my calculator. Make sure that I'm doing the math. So we have 11. Point Seven nine plus eight point eight divided by two times. If we do no, no, no. Uh, if you can do it, then add the thickness of the metal and add the thickness of the metal before yeah. doing your three point one four one five. Right. That's right. Three, okay. Three mm -hmm. So let's do that again. We've got eleven point seven nine plus. 8.8 plus, what did I say the metal was? No, no, the, no, 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 no. When you add them together, <laughs> then divide them by two to find the average. Yes, and, I'm, but I'm, am I dividing after I've added the metal or before? This uh, is, we're getting more complex by the moment. <laughs> you know, you were doing fine before I messed you up. So go with, okay. with 3.5, yeah. All right, 12 plus, 12 plus 8.8, 20 divided by 2, 10 times 3.5. So 35 ballpark, and we'll find out if I'm, if I'm doing too much ballparking, if I go to 35. Worst case is, I cut a little extra scrap off. There we go, ballpark, my ballpark. So that should be enough to get me around. Yeah, that'll be plenty. And then what I care about is, John writes out those math directions a lot better than I am articulating them because it flusters me so much, especially when I'm on camera. Um, so my total height is 5.85 from Coulette to table. But we don't want that with its tail hanging out and we need a little bit of room. So we need to make this taller than that um, because I want to, let me draw that since that was poorly spoken. So if my stone is doing this, my setting needs to not allow the point to hang out off the edge and needs to have enough room to go up over the girdle and create that wall. My inner one is gonna be shorter than that, but, they're, but they need to at least clear and leave a little room. You don't want the um, tip of the stone poking into the ring wear or, wh or whatever it's going against. You don't want it chipping against metal. So give yourself a little bit to as much as you want extra room. One of the nice things about this kind of setting is that you can make really tall bezels and it sort of creates this little castle top effect to it. So I'm going to give myself, uh, I'm going to go about seven to give myself a nice tall-ish. No, I need to go a little taller than that, I think. I'm going to go about 8.5. That gives me room to file. And it gives me 
Um, and it gives me a little bit of uh, room to give myself some height on, the, on this particular design. Um, with 22 gauge, again, I'm likely to go to my shears, but you can also saw, especially if you're going heavier gauge. Um, keeping in mind that by using shears, you're curling your metal a bit. So you're gonna wanna be aware of that and flatten it back down. Oops, and I went way beyond the length that I needed because I wasn't paying attention. So here's my little ill-measured outer wall. And I'm gonna flatten it down a bit before I start shaping it. And I'm gonna just grab half round pliers, my personal favorites that I use more than just about anything. And I'm gonna start shaping it roughly into the oval. You can also hammer this around a mandrel if you've got a good mandrel. Um, I find most mandrels, whatever mandrel I've picked or whatever shape I've picked, the mandrel is not quite the right form for it. Let's see how close I got. Yeah, I gave myself a little extra. So um, I'm getting this to the approximate shape. I may need to actually anneal this. This doesn't feel terribly well annealed to give myself a little more room. And I'm looking for the outermost size that I need for this wall. And again, I want a good clean fit. Worst case, if it's a little small, you'll size it up. So this is looking like a fairly good fit so far. And I like to, one of the ways I know I've got a good fit personally is that I can hold it in there without having to put any pressure to hold it in place. Just keep in mind that when I cut that away, I'm gonna have, I've got a tiny little gap of extra material there. So I wanna trim it a little small. Again, it's easier to size up than it is to size down. If you're sizing down, you're gonna end up cutting it open and resoldering it. So I'm gonna make my mark with the scribe that I've managed to bury somewhere in my tools. Okay, where did I hide it? Hmm. Probably six different scribes near me. I just gotta find the right one. Nice small mark. All right, so um, I'm going to saw down that once I've got my stone out of the way. And as impatient as I am, um, I sometimes cut the seam with shears too, but I'm trying to do the John method and always be sawing it to get a nice clean fit. And it is a nice clean fit, that's for sure. Oh, come on, little saw blade, get in there. Wow. Just mangle my saw blade. Okay, so I am sawing through. It's in screen, sorry, trying to figure out how to best show this. Very messy cut. Reshape that a little bit. So when in doubt, if your seam isn't clean, close it back up, 
cut it again. Straighten it back out. All right, I'm headed over to the soldering bench. Doing the spray flux and my paste flux on the seam. Uh, John likes to do these up in the air, held in tweezers. I can't manage that coordination while still getting it to flow cleanly. Um, we end up having to do that a little bit on the prong setting, but it's a slightly different setup. So, and remembering that heating the back of it before you heat the seam area is gonna encourage the piece to close towards itself. I'm using hard solder. I have a good enough closure here, but we'll see. Um, in class, John tends to not do much pickling if he can avoid it between steps, as why get the acid in gaps and things like that um, if you don't need to. Now we have our basic bezel shape, but it needs a little bit of cleanup. So I'm going to actually bring out one of my mandrels at this point to give myself a little bit more controlled shaping of it. Missing any John steps along the way. I think this is still on track. You remember if you're putting it on a, be on a bezel, you're gonna wanna hammer from both directions so that it doesn't taper on you. And again, that oval may not be the exact shape of the oval I'm working towards. So it's really just to sort of get it started. Or you may have another mandrel that's going to do a better job of fitting. Wow, that really mangled it. Let's see. Get that shaped a little better. So I'm just uh, using my half rounds and squeezing around it. Thank you for ever, whoever posted the Rhino gel. Um, I'll, I also find with ovals, sometimes it's easier to, to put it on a round mandrel, get it really nice and round and then flatten it from the side to give you your oval shape. See how we're doing, feels a little bit flat on one side. Nope, the other way around. It's not flat enough. So I'm just going to flatten it a bit on my block. A bit more. You have to be careful not to force it because you want a snug fit, but you don't want a chip the edge of the stone fit. I think I need to size this up one or two squishes. So again, I like to start with the half round, but if that's not getting you enough material moved, use, uh, use the um, round flat. It just puts more marks in it. Um, I'm doing one on each side to start. And remember to flip it so that you're evenly stretching the top and the bottom. So close, I can taste it more about the shape than it is about the size. One wall, just a little too curved for this oval.
Okay, super, super close. I'm gonna go grab my oval mandrel that's a little closer to this shape. Figure out where the oval mandrel is. Just barely, just small enough for this. So it's gonna be a little bit better. So um, for me, this is the painstaking part of this process. It's really just a tiny movement and then reset, reshape, and then a tiny movement and recheck, tiny movement, recheck. Um, and finding the right mandrel. There's a reason that I have probably three different oval mandrels. Still needs a smidge of sizing up, I think. Um, and doing the outer one first ensures that we have um, a pattern to work to, if that makes sense, for the inner ring. It's, you know, sometimes I've seen people teach the making something that the stone can rest on before you make the outer wall. Um, and I find that more difficult to match up the, the walls when I'm doing it that way. Come on, that should do it. Let's see. In a perfect world, once you've got both layers together, your stone is just going to go click into the position it belongs. That's how snug it should be. Um, and technically you can resize this a little bit once you've got the two halves together, but it becomes harder to control um, because you'll have a lip that is thinner than the, uh, you know, at the top where, we're, where we're, the seat is gonna, there's not gonna be material for part of it where the seat goes. So it's harder to resize after you got this worked out. Seam side on both. Almost. And it gets you your hand workout for the day. So uh, as a reminder, your seam is going to be on the center of the long side when you do this. You don't want it at an end or a corner bend or anything. And that'll be appropriate to how you start setting it. Then you're going to center. It's going to be your east-west, I guess. Ugh, I can feel it. It's ready to go. Come on. What am I missing? A perfect oval. That's what I'm missing. Back on the mandrel briefly. on the mandrel, be careful not to be stretching more than you realize you are. Pushing down the mandrel too far. Okay, I swear this is changing size every time I do it. <laughs> Nothing different to be done for the uh, the outer side, outer round. If you're working on a round, 
Um, when we get to other shapes, we're changing our approach. So that's why we do these first. Nope, still needs a smidge more. Go with the heavy duty and switch to the rounds, or half round pliers instead of the flat half rounds. Sorry, I'm switching to the round flat instead of the half round. Just to give a little bit more oomph to my stretch. Okay, and uh, we are going to um, use our filing block again. I'll put my stone somewhere that I won't damage it. So I'm bringing out my handy dandy plexiglass container, or plexiglass sanding device. And I'm just gonna clean up. Rachel, again, I'm wet sanding. Rachel, may I interject? Say again? May I interject while you're doing that plexiglass sure. sanding um, that you can do that on clipboards? Mm -hmm. So you put clipboards with one grit on different clipboards. And just flip through them? And just flip through them. Yeah. Nice. It's not probably not the best with water, though. Oh, if it's a wood clipboard, no, but you can get like these kind of clipboards probably would be great for that. So that's a good place to, to start. You can also, of course, file. You don't have to sand if you're, if you're good at getting a good flush surface, but the cleaner that you get your, um, your walls, the easier the next step is going to be. And I'm just using my 320 because I'm trying to take material down quickly. I don't, I don't need to go through all of these other layers of it. All right, so I've got my basic bezel. I'm going to check that my sanding didn't put me out of alignment with the stone, although I'll have a chance to reshape it afterwards. No? Okay. Um, and now I need to build my inner wall, which I'm going to do out of 24 gauge. I need to move a few tools. I put a few too many things out without putting things away. Go. All right. So the 24 gauge is going to be the, um, the shorter wall, the interior wall. And we are cutting it for what fits inside of the one we've already built. We're not worrying so much about the stone as does it fit inside this piece. Okay. Um, and then height wise, we need to be assured that we have enough room to go up over the girdle. So our, our second wall, I'm gonna draw this because it's not gonna show for scale. And John's got some great drawings on this showing the slices of things. Um, just make sure that what you're, what you're building, we've built this outer wall that allows for the stone 
and this is an exaggeration, we're gonna end up being about like that probably for the stone, our girdle, excuse my crappy drawing. I said that was gonna be one of the things I'm working on as part of this project. So we're now about to build the inner wall, which we're gonna solder together here. So it's gonna rest just below that girdle line so that the stone is coming in off of that, right? So we need enough room from here to here that there's room to set the stone. So this distance is what we're aiming for in our inner 24 gauge. So this one I'm personally doing in 22 gauge and this one I'm doing in 24 gauge. Twenty-four gauge. There we go. Okay. So what I can do is use my calipers or my dividers to get the height less what I have. So if this is my current height, I'm going to drop it down by enough that I will that I won't leave my stone hanging out the end, but I will leave enough room to set the stone over the over the table all right uh sharpie marker to give myself a line doing for time 625. okay cut them straight out and i am not worrying too much about the measurement inside, you can absolutely do some math to figure out what your inner diameter is. Or you can take your fairly thin metal and actually make the shape of it, you know, bend it in and, and get it sized to what appears to fit inside. So I'm going to use my half round pliers again to get my approximation. And then I'm gonna start squishing it down a little bit, remembering that we err on the side of smaller than larger, because we can size up, it's not easy to size down in this case. So I'm getting something that is likely to fit just inside my, uh, the inside of my bezel. And I'm going to check and trim as needed. Um, what I'm looking for is snug fitting. Oh, and it's good to get in the habit of working this on the opposite side. So the seam, when we solder it in place, is going to be opposite the first seam. That's an important uh, strength and le it less frustration of seams opening up. So. What I mean by that is this is the side I've got seamed on my outer wall. This is gonna be the side that my seam lands on when I'm putting things together. But I'm not there yet because I'm gonna make my inner, inner loop. Goodness, I'm tired today. I'm not saying my word, my words are not coming out the way I mean them to. Um, so I'm making my entire inner ring. I am not yet soldering it in place because I need to make it and size it properly. So I'm aiming for as close a fit as I can, erring on the side of a little bit small, which I'm going to do on purpose today so that we can do the sizing up exercise. That's going to be ever so slightly too small for this set. And I'm going to pop back over and solder it real quick.
heating from the back side of the seam rather than from on top of the seam so it doesn't open up on me. Checking that my seam actually got fully flowed. It did not, so I'm gonna to touch that back up again. All right, so once again, the sanding and filing only happens when you are at their last possible minute that you can't get to it anymore. And if it's getting in the way of what you're doing, in this case, if you have a lump of solder on the outside of your bezel, it may interfere with getting a clean fit. So um, once you reshape it uh, to match, check to make sure that it is actually doing all right in terms of snug fit, no solder in the way. And even if it fits well on this first pass, you're not gonna try to shove it into place because we need to do that beveling that um, I pointed out in the drawings he's got. So this is actually a little bit loose, intentionally so, so that we can show the sizing. The fact that I can just slide it in there that easily means that I've made it too small and I need to size it up so that it's hard to get in there. So you can see I could actually push that in, slotted, because it's ever so slightly too loose. So I'm gonna use my um, pliers and size it up a smidge. And this is one that you wanna do one or two sets of squeezes at a time and check if you're close because you don't wanna overdo it or else you'll have to cut it apart and put it back in. And so I'm getting one or two squeezes may have been enough for this one. Let's see, nope, it's still too easy. So if I can get it that far in, um, let me actually blacken one of these so that you can, see what is happening. So if I can get it that far in that I can push it down, it's not snug enough. It needs to be snugger of a fit. So I'm gonna keep stretching it a little bit at a time, one or two squeezes, remembering to go both directions on the wall. And I'm remembering that my seams go opposite each other starting to get there, it's being a little bit more difficult to get in place, but I'm still looking for even more snug. Remember that my goal is that I wanna hammer it in the way that he shows us on, what page was that? Page two, page 62. Okay, we are now at a point where it's gonna be difficult for me to push it into place. So my next thing that I need to do is sand to get a nice clean fit because once I've got this put in place, I'm not gonna have another chance to flatten what is going to be the resting spot for my stone. So I'm gonna clean up the edge that I'm gonna be beveling so that I have an even flat surface. And if you're, if you're a little bit messy about your cut, you may wanna flatten both sides and check with calipers to make sure that you've got an even um, size all the way around. If, when in doubt, go a little bit longer than you think because you can always leave a tail of it sticking out I still need to get a little bit more snug than that. So you can always leave a little bit hanging out the bottom um, and trim it off later. Just 
just get, getting a little bit more snug because that sanding showed that it can still slide in. Okay, so I'd have to use some force to get it into place. I'm very close to as big as I want it to be for this. And remembering that my seams go opposite at all times. Okay, I'm now at a point that I've got a decent flat file. I may want to even check to see what my stone's going to look like sitting on it. That this on this inner one, it should be just basically resting on there, and that'll show just how little material you need. John talks about twenty-four gauge and barely needing it to be supporting the wall. And when you when you make one of the inner rings and you rest your stone on it, you see how that looks. I'm going to try and show that from the side. It's not really showing well, but. Um, so I've now got my shape, I've got my uh, sanding, so it's got a flat surface. I'm now going to do the step that is making the channel for my solder. And I'm going to take a barrette file in this case. Um, this is basically the same exercise that I was doing around the outside of the heavy bezel, except in this case, it's okay to make it be up to a triangular point because we're going to fill that in with solder. So I'm making an angle. It really is hard to both see this work and not block you guys and hold my filing steady at the same time. That whole nearsighted thing. So again, just making angular top along my already sanded flat top edge. And the benefit of this is if you have the really snug fit, just having this tiny little um, channel will give it like a start to how you can pound it into place or tap it into place. I'm not gonna pound it so much. Remembering seam side opposite my other seam, and angles facing down. I'm putting it into place and now I have to actually work to get it in there. So I'm gonna take, in his example, I think he's using the back of his bench pin and just carefully tap it in. If you've made it um, too tall, you're not going to be able to let your stone rest in there. But if you've made it the right height, you'll see that your stone is just fitting. This is a little hard to hold because I don't have it angled right, but your stone should just, just be sitting on the wall that you've just created, popped in there. Okay. Again, it's okay if it sticks out over the edge. In this case, what I see is I have a little bit of a gap I want to take care of, even though it was tough. I don't know if that gap is, yeah, there we go. That gap is showing. I don't want that gap there before I start soldering. So I'm going to actually use my half rounds again and try to stretch my metal in place. If it's not going to stretch to, to fill the gap, then I'm going to have to take it back out again in order to um, size it up a little more and jam it in a second time. getting there. Um, the reason I probably have this gap is that uh, I didn't stretch it as much as I thought I did. So it was a difference in size. So the fact that I can slide it back out tells me I need to um, size it even more. So bear with me while I stretch things a little bit further. I'll show the um, fit of this a little bit more on the on the better camera in just a second. Seams opposite each other, filed side facing in. Oh, 
that's a better fit. I'm a little happier with that. I could probably do with a squeeze or two more just because I'm getting a little bit of gapping, but I think solder will also fill that. And I'm looking on, the, let me bring this over to the other camera. You guys will be able to see it better. So, uh, zooming in, bear with me. Yeah. How's the focus for that, guys? We're good on focus? Okay, so what you can see is that because I've made it so snug, the wall is really touching the inner wall to the outer wall. On the back, you can see there's a like fingernail sliver in one edge of it that's not fitting. In a perfect world, that would be butted right up, but that's probably enough for solder to fill. Um, and I've got it flush and I've got it level. And if you're not sure if you've got it level, you may want to run a set of calipers around that um, just to make sure that you've got it even. Um, if you're having trouble with your sizing of it, you may want to um, make one, make your inner wall longer and let it stick out and then you'll cut it away. But in a perfect world, this is pretty close to what I would want for any of these settings. Oops, I keep going out of, out of range. So that's what we're doing from the back. And John's uh, description is that we're going to hold this from the bottom or from the top rather, so upside down. Let me zoom back out. We're holding it in our tweezers from the bottom, fluxing. And keep in mind that at this point, the angled bevel part is hidden right about there. So the mission of this soldering exercise is we're going to put solder on the top and get it to flow down to fill the gap we filed, to fill that, that little angle portion. Um, I'm watch the everything flux. Put on my goggles. And in, in this, he's still suggesting we use hard solder, I think. Let me double check that in a minute. Uh, is, oh, he, he gives us the luxury of choosing hard or medium solder. Um, I'm going to try with hard solder. Um, were I doing this not from the John book, I would be working in um, medium probably for this step personally. So, and he always likes to double flux. I always forget that. So he heats the first pass of the flux and then he fluxes a second time and puts his solder pieces on with some more flux. So we're putting the solder along the top and uh, he does this all held in his hands up in the air. I don't have the coordination for that. And you're being generous with the solder because it's going to flow down through the walls into that crevice. Position that a little better. Is that still in view for you guys? Yes. Okay, and heating broadly. Trying to get the solder to flow down into the crack. I'm gonna try and hold, this is not the normal angle I would be soldering this at. I'm trying to hold it so that you guys can see the action. Is that showing? Can you see the solder? I can't hear, I mean, I can't see if anybody's saying yes. Um, All right, so we got some flow, but we may have also gotten a seam opening up on the inside bezel. Bear with me and I'll take a peek. Ever so slightly. Let's see if I can zoom in enough that you guys can see that. I may have to pickle it to show it, but I'm not sure. Mm. 
So the inside bezel, yep, you can see it better from that end. So right where my fingernail is pointing, yeah, it's not gonna show on the camera no matter what I zoom. Um, what happened is because I did not have 100% snug inner bezel, it opened up and sized itself to the, the outer wall. Now it's done it literally, I can barely get the tip of my fingernail into the crack. So my choices are remake the bezel or cheat and flow some solder in the crack that's opened up um, or ignore it and hope that nobody notices. In this case, I would personally be filling it with solder. I know that's sacrilege, um, but it's such a small crevice that that's what I would end up doing. If it were a wider gap, um, I wouldn't put up with it. I might put a piece, uh, I might cut a sliver of silver to put in there. Does anybody have other things that they do when that happens? Rachel, does it matter really for the integrity of holding the stone? No, absolutely not. But if I'm doing, uh, if I'm if I'm setting it in something that someone could see the back, oh. I don't have a nice clean line. What I'll have is a line with a skip in it, and mm -hmm. and I mean potentially I could even file down all the way, but I'd then have thicker and thinner material around the wall. Um, so it's more about your personal precision. For me, I'm trying to do these well and do these right. Um, so what I will what I will probably do is make another one over, but in this case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repair this, repair it, meaning I'm gonna put a little solder flow in there um, just so that I don't personally get distressed by the fact that I have a gap there. And then as an exercise for myself, I'm gonna make another bezel a little more snugly than I did. So, but I wanted you guys to see the, the troubleshooting issue that you may come up with. If you have not made that truly, you need to hammer it into place, it's really, that, that it, this is caused by that little fingernails worth of gap that I was talking about when I pointed it out before I soldered it. <laughs> Aside from cursing, Saren says, yes, that's another thing you can do when this happens. I curse more when they're gold than I do when they're silver. Um, any other ways that people handle that? It's so small. I don't know. I mean, I would be afraid that I would melt it at this point if I was going to mess with it. So, well, I keep in mind, we've used in this case, we used hard solder for both of them. So, that's a good point. I could just use a tiny snippet of medium solder as my pay, repair. Um, or, it, again, in the past, if I've had a bigger one that gapped way more, I've cut a sliver of silver and soldered it into the seam. Um, and then you sand it down, but then you've got, you know, it's, it's more about what's the aesthetic of having the slight off color of the solder. Um, and John does never tell us what to do when you don't do it completely the way he wants you to. <laughs> um, otherwise it's a fairly solid and stable bezel on that. Um, and I will, I will repractice it because that's part of what I'm doing in this book is trying to slow down and, and perfect some things that I, might have otherwise shortcut it. Um, I'm going to pickle this and open it up to questions. Okay, anyone? Bueller, anyone? Um, we are at 645 and I had planned to also start doing a square ring, square, square inset version for a round ring, a round stone. Um, meaning I'm using square wire instead of the wall. Um, I can start that now. We probably will get most of the way to this same stage, or I can keep cleaning this up on screen. What's What do people want to see? Maybe the Good. finished product. You want to get to the finished product? <laughs> okay, that's one vote for that. Anybody else care one way or the other? If you're taking votes, I would vote for working on more of the setting tools. Working on the setting tools in rather than regard? starting another project. If you're finishing that one, great. But if you're looking for a transition, then like working with the nails um, would be awesome. Seeing so, I don't have anything be... yet to set. Is the thing. Um, so, 
actually working with those tools. The, the reason I ran through them is in case you want to try setting before I get to the setting. Um, uh, I meant the making, the shaping of them. Oh, there wasn't more to it really than that. I'm, I'm okay. it's literally, yeah, it's cleaning it up and, and giving yourself a, an end shape that works for you. Square um, or, or rectangular is what John is recommending. Um, the only other thing that I have that I was going to mod is I was personally going to, because I don't have an official um, setting punch, I was going to make one of my nails that I like into a setting punch. Um, which I've already started. It's just filing down the ends of it. Let me toss this in the pickle while I'm talking. Um, so let's see. I have one in favor. I don't have. I don't have more to show you on those setting tools. Frankly, it's it's just file it and buff it until you have a shape that you like. Fair enough. Um, and maybe make a few different shapes so that you can see if some some things work better for you than others. Uh, the square bezel setting, just I mean the square wire version of what we've just set, um, is going to be actually a cabochon, just so you can see the difference in how they rest on things. So I'm using the same shape that I did for my first basic bezel, so we can see the difference. Um, and it's the same exercise of painstakingly getting a fit. Uh, the difference is that it's a little harder to keep the wire um, uh, shelf in place than it is uh, a wall, uh, a sheet wall. Um, yeah. So I'll, as soon as that finishes pickling, I'll go back to sanding and filing on it. Um, because then I'll also be able to see whether I need to do a little solder touch up to the interior. And in the meantime, uh, let me talk about what we're going to do on the next session, um, which will start with finishing off the um, square wire version of this and move on to do next up. Um, we will work on a rectangle next. I'm going to be using a um, cabochon, and I'll be working in 22, ga uh, 22 gauge outer wall, 24 gauge inner wall. And it's going to be the, the technique for the same um, multi-part setting that we just did, except what you do differently for square. Nancy, I will definitely be working on that. Um, it will, it'll be in the next video if it's not in this video, if we don't, if I don't keep working on that um, right now. So we'll, we'll, I'll do a little bit of juggling. I'll file with one hand, I'll sand with the other, you know, we'll get there. Um, but I'm not skipping the stone. I'm just, it's just whether we do it this session or next. Uh, so next session, we're going to finish whatever I haven't finished from this round um, and then move to rectangle and then square. So my rectangle is going to be a cabochon. My square is going to be faceted. Um, and for the cabochon, I'm going to be making the two-part walls. And for the square, I'm going to try his version where he talks in page. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, he does, calls it method two, starting on page 67, in which we're making um, step bezel wall before we then measure and file and cut it and, and so on. Um, when you get to the squares, you are absolutely going to want to have your triangle and square files um, with you. Good, good needle files for those. Um, I also recommend that if you don't have a pair of parallel jaw pliers, that you have that for your cornering. Um, and then I don't think we'll get to it at the rate we're going, but I'll, the, the next in line after rectangle and square is a triangular stone with, with um, flat sides. I'm not doing a trillion for this. I'm just doing a an actual good sized triangle. Um, and mine is a little bit off of, uh, it's not a equilateral triangle. It's a little bit of an odd shape, um, but that is faceted and that will go back to using the two-part wall. Um, 
And so it's looking like we're going to get sort of one and a half to two settings on this chapter moving through it. We may get a little faster when we get to some of the tube-based settings. Um, and as a reminder, it looks like by about April, late April, we'll get to chapter four at the rate of two sessions per month. And by that time, you will definitely want a couple pairs of stainless steel cross-locking straight pliers, I mean, straight tweezers. You do not want them to be um, tungsten or anything like that. And you'll want that small hinge file, probably. That is for doing our prong settings. Um, again, this is uh, not my normal class pace. When I'm teaching a workshop, I'm usually doing a um, cycle of I talk, I demo, you go back to your bench and work, get asking me questions as needed. Uh, and then we show off and we do that looping through the day. Um, if you have any interest in classes, I am actually te teaching as full-on workshops instead of just me babbling at you about what I'm doing. Um, the schedule is up on my teaching page. My next class is about clasps. Um, and then I have a hollow forms and uh, uh, bezels less ordinary at the end of the year where we do fancier things with some of these settings. Um, and it looks like I'll be scheduled for a, a virtual class at Metalworks in mid-July. Um, so I will pop that up there, hit the link for that if you're interested in looking those classes over. Um, that's as much promotion as I'm comfortable doing. So <laughs> there's that. Um, okay, so I'm probably done with the pickle. And I think given that we have 15 minutes left before we go into show and tell mode, um, then I think probably finishing what I've got on this one that's already in progress is for the best. And I'll do the square wall really quickly at the beginning of next session and then move into rectangle and square. Okay, so. Miss Rachel, can you show yes. another question? Um, can, I'm sorry. Can you show what a small hinge file looks like? What the chenier file or the hinge file is? Yes. yes. Hang on a sec. Let me go to the right bench location. And so if you have a set of Euro Tools itty bitty minis, there's probably one in there. And it's going to be like this. Let's see. Where it has file edge, file teeth on the edge and on the other edge, but it's smooth the way that a barrette file is on the wider planes. You can get them bigger than this. They come in a variety of sizes. And apparently in the US, they're not being marketed as chenier. They're, at, they're listed as hinge or what was the other term we found? Anyone? We po I posted a couple places that, and, and apparently auto fry is one of the few places that has them. right now in the US. Um, but you may you may actually have one in either your mini needle files or your existing needle file set if you if you have a good like 10 or 12 needle files. So again, flat, no, no filing surface, no filing surface, filing surface, filing surface. And it's nothing that you'll be able to see, but usually one side is almost um, like a half round and the other one is sort of flattish round. So there's two, on a good one of these, there's gonna be two different curves to them. Um, and those are the reason that we're getting these. I love these files for other things that I do. They're great for hinges. They're great for um, like, if I'm trying to get a slot into something for a jump ring. But the reason we're getting them is because John is recommending them when you're hand cutting the seats in your prongs, okay? There are other ways, if you're doing round, you can also use, um, he talks about using um, setting burrs is what he uses for his rounds. But this is so that if you're not doing something that's not a round, you'll get, you'll be able to hand cut any of your seats. Okay, so um, we're down to evaluating whether this truly has gapped. It has gapped enough that I'm not comfortable leaving that as is. So I'm gonna pop over and quickly toss a little joint file. Yes, thank you, Helen. It's called a joint file. Um, in addition to being referred to as a hinge file or a chenier file. 
my goggles. Goggles. Okay, so I'm gonna do quick touch up to this with medium solder. And then for penance in the Church of John, I will go back and um, I will remake this bezel after this session. Not making you guys watch that part. So I'm just touching down a smidge bit of medium solder. And the one thing that I can't get close enough to really show y'all um, that is worth looking at when you do this yourself is because we put that lovely little um, angled, angled filing in there, um, if you've done this well and haven't overwhelmed it with solder, you shouldn't really see anything but a nice clean fit at the top of your, um, at the top of your setting. Wow, this is using more solder than it should. So my gap is painful. And I'm not heating it well. This is definitely telling me to remake this. All right, I'm gonna not fucks with it any further. But I am going to um, sand and file it so that we can see that process. And while I am doing this, I'm gonna suggest that if anybody has some show and tell, um, from the last session or is stuck on something from last session or this session that you let me know and we pop you up on screen. Does anybody want to share? Don't all jump at once. Anyone? No, I don't know what it is. Is that a maybe? I don't know how to do this. I'm hearing somebody starting to talk. Let me get the participants list up so I can see you. Oh my goodness, my Zoom does not want to let me adjust the controls. Okay, who's up? Anybody want to show? Nancy showed hers on the page. Yes, Nancy, that was wonderful. I saw that you, that was your rose cut that you set. Yes, it was a little bit more um, minimal type of jewelry than I'm used to making. Yeah. So that was a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> Usually you add flourishes. Oh man, I got some stamping and that thing's as big as the moon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you practice what you practice and then you expand out to the next thing. Absolutely. Um, that's what I think. Good. Uh, anybody else have something that they want to share or a, a progress question? I have a question about the bezel wire. Sure. You had mentioned 22 and something else for the inner and the outer. Are they the same gauge? No, no. So for the, the bezel that I'm working on now is 22 gauge sheet on the exterior and 24 gauge on the interior. I'm going to go back to me so you can see. So this outer wall is 22 gauge and the inner wall is 24. John's telling us in the book that the, the minimum we need for the inner wall is 24 the outer wall you can play around with. So for example, we could use 18 gauge on the outer wall if we wanted to, if we want the big thick bezel effect, um, but it's it doesn't have to be. I'm just choosing these as a sort of a midpoint. I like the strength and durability. I, I like the, the feel of a 22 gauge personally, visually. It's not too much for a stone. I don't like to have overwhelming, especially a faceted stone, but I may, you know, I could try, uh, thicker bezel around my cabochon if I wanted to. I could I could bump that up a little bit. But a minimum of 24 gauge on the interior. 
when I do the um, square wire version, uh, I'm going to be using 18 gauge square wire in part because it was what I had, um, but I could roll some down to make it smaller if I wanted to. It just seems like a nice frame. I'm, I'm sort of visualizing what happens if somebody looks at the back of the stone. Any other questions? Okay, and my follow up with that, are you, sometimes you can order like fine silver or sterling silver for the basil. So oh, what yeah. do you suggest? So I am, John is not having us work with bezel wire in any of this. Um, and part of the reason for that is that bezel wire doesn't come in all the sizes you might want. Uh, he also works exclusively in sterling for this kind of thing. Um, there are arguments about uh, sterling silver is less malleable than fine silver, and therefore it is, in theory, going to hold the stone a little bit more supported. If anybody has strong opinions on that, speak up. I know that when I'm, when I'm doing my own work, I'm often working in a fine silver wall but um, uh, uh, it, the, the Facebook page, we'll put the link back up again for the Facebook page, hang on. Um, so it, I would work in sterling silver sheet instead of trying to buy wire, but it's up to you what you wanna use. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anything else? Here is the Facebook page link. If my copy and paste will will work. Come on. Oop, thank you for getting that. Oh, except I've double linked it. Let me try a single link. There's the single link. Okay. Any other questions from folks or demoing? Toby, are you trying to get my attention by flagging something or are you just moving? Oops, you're on mute still. Sorry, I was scrolling for the uh, reading. Oh, got it, okay. Got okay. Um, any other questions or any other show off stuff? Okay, I'm happy to stay on till 7.30 and I'll keep cleaning this one and or moving on to the square wire if people want me to, but otherwise we can call it a night. You know, I've said two to two and a half to three hours is sort of my limit for being able to be this on stage for you. Um, but I can sit, I can sit here and continue to sand and file and chat with folks. I'm out of here, sorry, I'll see so that's you later. Okay. This is Suzanne. Okay. I See promise I won't the next Monday, then. okay? Pardon? The next Monday. The next one is, uh, what is our date for the next one? Um, mm -hmm. I put it in my notes. Our next session is February 2nd. Monday, right? Wednesday. Pardon? Wednesday. It's always going to be a Wednesday. It's the first and third Wednesdays. Right. Okay. And if you want to make sure that you always have the right link when you get I put it all on your Google. emails, pardon? Yeah. I put it on Google. Yeah, you can attach it to any any of the calendars that are out there. You can just say, yes, put it in my calendar. Um, and no, remember please. that there's a different link for the first and the third each session. So yes. it's the same link for all the firsts and then another same link for all the thirds, if that makes sense. Right. I got <laughs> it. Thank you. Thank you, gang. And feel free to drop off. I will not start on the square wire frame one. I'm just gonna work on finishing up this one that I've done. So feel free to ask questions or just sit companionably or head off to dinner or whatever your respective activities are. Actually, I have a question that's relevant to me and perhaps to a few others, not so much to design. Well, it has an effect. As I've aged, my hands have become shaky and I'm struggling in the making, uh, getting my solder where it needs to be. Um, and I'm wondering what solutions people have come up with. Are you already using third hands? Not for placing of the solder. 
Oh, the actual literal putting down of the solder is tough. Yeah. So the biggest challenge I've seen, I've, I have had students who've had MS, and so they have a per, sort of semi-permanent palsy. Um, uh, and uh, the best thing that I've found is turn the torch off, put it down, use the, use the a, a paste solder in particular acts as a glue. So you put your flux oh. down and then heat it a little bit so it gets crispy, then turn your torch off, position things in your own time, pick solder, whichever, which, whether it's a pick or whether it's a pair of tweezers, whatever works for you and move it around until it's where you want it and then scooch back in with the torch. So it's, it's about pausing to position things. Great, that's a great idea, paste yeah. solder. Good. Uh, no, so paste solder as an option, certainly. Um, I actually meant the flux can act as a paste. If you're using the, um, the uh, like a griff flux or something like that, that's, that acts as a, as a glue factor to stick down your solder. Now, so it's not really good enough I managed to knock everything loose tonight. Got it. Got it. Okay, then yes, maybe the maybe the paste solder. Just know that um, even if it hardens on you, you can reconstitute it. It's bloody expensive. Paste solder is, um, and it's hard to control your amounts. So your your trick is going to be using like a pin or something to take little bits off of the tube. But even if the tube dries out, there's ways to reconstitute it. I can't remember. How does there. one do that? There, there's a specific oil. I don't use it often enough um, to really know the materials that are used. I just have read up on it. Anybody else use paste solder on a regular basis that they know what to mix it with once you've ground it back up? No? Mm, no. Okay. It's, there's certainly articles on ganoxin or things like that on that topic. Um, but it, it's, it's about crushing the, the you know, sand, filing the, the remains of the existing paste solder into a little dust and then mixing in the oil and it reconstitutes. I'll tell you what, what I've come to, to start using. Someone told me, you know, I've always bought wire solder, you guys. Yep. Well, take it through your rolling mill, smash it really flat, then cut little tiny snippets. Now for, for the, the solder wanting to move around like you're having that problem with, I use paste solder. Um, you know, the white paste solder, I don't even, handy flux. Yeah, I use flux, called handy flux. And I put it a little bit on there. Then I put the, um, the solder on there. Then it just takes a few minutes to dry. And then when you go solder with, I mean, then when you take your torch to it, it doesn't blow it all over the places. It kind of sticks it in there. It's kind of like stuck in there like a glue. And that will help. Nice. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, feel free to text me or, I mean, feel free to, you know, private message me anything if I can help. I have problems with my hands. I've had um, constructive surgery, reconstructive surgery done on both of my hands. So sometimes it's just a matter of finding something that will work for you. I don't see who's speaking. Who's speaking? This is me, Nancy. Oh. Am I showing up on the video? Uh, you're not actually on video. It's just a black screen for you now, but um, it's a little surprising that it's not highlighting you. Hang on. Right. Okay. Really weird. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing wrong because I'm... Um, am I up there now? No. Hang on. Let me see Nancy right. Markham? Yeah, that's me, baby. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> It looks like your camera might be closed when um, when it goes completely black like that. Do you have it open and closed there on your camera? No, I don't see anything that says this, guys. You have oh, tape boy. on your camera? <laughs> nope. <laughs> I, already I took that off from the brand new when I got the new computer. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, well, I guess I'm just going to be a mystery person, a voice from the beyond. <laughs> I like that wise one. <laughs> so um, on my filing, one of the things that I'm doing besides the outer wall, if I don't drop the piece, um, is I'm filing the bottom. And I know I've done a good job soldering if, I, if the um, seam line disappears. 
So I say either file or sand or a combination of both. Um, as you can see that we can see the two lines, maybe you can see, we can see the two lines, but by sanding it down, I need to spotlight myself again. So you can see that we've got a fairly close seam, but until I actually sand and file it down, that's when the magic happens. That's when it disappears and it makes it look like there's only a single wall of metal. And that's when you've got success with your soldering and with your snug fit. Any other general questions out there or things you want opinions from the crowd, gang? Night, Jody. If you haven't popped off already. Thank you, Rachel. I'm going to go. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. Somebody managed to do sharing. Hang on. Nancy, you're sharing your screen. Uh, my computer was going crazy. I'm glad you figured that out. Nope. It's just that she managed to share screen on us. Uh, let me see. How do I stop her from sharing screen? I think I may have to share screen myself. There we go. Now you see a whiteboard, I hope. No, I still, I still see Nancy's screen. Hmm. Okay. I, was she trying to leave? Maybe, I don't know. Because I, I see your screen. My so screen, I okay. Oh, it's this back. So let me stop sharing then if I can get my tools back. Hey, Saren, are you able to kick me out of sharing as a host? Oh, there they are. Never mind. They came back up. Stop no, share. There we go. Now I see your, your camera. Excellent. Looking yep, that's right. Sanding board. What was that? It's looking the camera on your sanding board. Yes, good. Okay, thank you. Um, although I'm gonna, I was about to switch over to show you all um, what the what the base starts to look like and why I care about a tiny crack and what it looks like in the setting. So, let's see if I can zoom in. know if I can get close enough to show, but maybe. So this is with me having sanded my back wall down. And right here is that seam that shows. So if I look at the back, I have a tiny little divot. Can you see what I'm pointing at, gang? Yes. So that's going to make me unhappy in my design. Yeah. And when I, when, if you can, if you look up inside of it, you'll see the seam. And that's why I'll be remaking this with a snugger fit than what I did. Is that the top or the bottom? That's the bottom. So, um, so this is the base of my piece. When you look at it from the other side, you can see what the resting position is. And now that you, now that I'm looking at it, I can actually see there's still some gap there, so I overall, I was just not snug enough. Okay. Um, 
So I needed to size it up probably like two squeezes of the pliers more in order to get a nice clean fit. Okay, you had mentioned a tape before? Using tape for sizing? Yes. Yeah, I literally just take, I get the super skinny masking tape. Hang on, I'll bring it over to my bench. You can use just about anything, painter's tape, masking tape, but I find the skinny tape, this stuff, you can just wrap it around the, the edge of the stone to get your sizing. Except I'm gonna be really awkward not being able to do it at my own position when I'm on screen. So you can do just tape around and give yourself a measurement. So you can mark how much material you need and then you just have to account for the additional thickness of the metal. So whatever that length is plus a smidge for the metal. Or if you're going thick, you know, how, whatever, the, whatever the width, I was doing like 0.71 with 22 gauge. So that's one way to do it. Or you just cut a much longer strip and shape it around and mark it and, and trim it down. Um, but yeah, I'm, I apologize that I'm not better at doing all the little steps on the math. I should be. It's a bit of an embarrassment. <laughs> um, and also the, you can't, it's not easy to do math if you're doing abstract shapes, which these settings work for pretty much any, this particular style of setting can work for pretty much any shape stone. Um, you just have to figure out whether it has corners that you need to deal with or not. Where did I put down the bezel in that process? There we go. I understand because I'm really <laughs> bad with math. I shouldn't be, it's just pressure math that gets to me. <laughs> If I can sit and doodle it on a piece of paper. I used to use a string. Oh, yeah. Not a bad call. Or, uh, you know, manila envelopes, strips of manila envelope. Um, and there's actually a heavy gauge foil called uh, florist's foil that you can model up things that holds the shape. Anyone else have questions or show off of anything? Well, I do have a question. I've been working on the little nails. Yeah. Because uh, I brought them tonight and that's kind of what I had in mind for doing. And I've shaped three of them um, kind of in different sizes and different angles. Like I would um, chasing, like miniature chasing and repousé tools. Because I've got nice. a few repousé I've got a few tools like that. Um, and I went from my file to sandpaper. Do I need, do I really need to sand any finer than like 800 on these? So do you have a polishing wheel? Do you have a buff? I do. Yeah, I mean, I've got a flex shaft. So I, I do lapidary work too. So I've okay. got, um, I've got a uh, Zam and I've got, um, I've also got all the different colors. I have MS, so I lose words. Um, but I have all the little colors that you put on the felt wheels, the like chalky things that melt in um, the brown, the white, the green. So colors don't help me so much. What I'm looking for is, is, it a, is one of them a cutting compound? I think Zam might be a blend of cutting and polishing. Um, okay. Because a cutting compound will have a little bit of a grit to, I'm thinking I'm talking at my screen and I'm talking at a screen that's not up. So the, the grittiness of it um, okay. uh, uh, is what you're looking for. It feels like it has a little sand in it. Um, gotcha. That one takes material down more than it polishes. And what okay. it does is it buffs and blunts anything left over from the scratches you've got. Okay, very good. Um, it's beautiful. And, and it's, it's a wonderful thing, but like... If you're using it on pattern sheet metal, it'll take your pattern off quickly. So just use gotcha. them carefully. Um, but that's all I'm doing is I'm making it so that it's sort of baby smooth. Um, okay. And so I don't go beyond, like I tend to do this with either coarse file or 320. So I'm not even going up to that 800 okay. if I have a polishing buff to put it on. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, sure. 
and and making a variety of them is great. Tell us what you like. Um, mo you know, do you like angles on them? Do you like the wider cut? Uh, what kind of set stones are you setting with them when you when you start playing around with the different versions? Okay, right on. Yeah. Anybody else have show and tell or questions? Okay. Yeah, I think um, because I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on this particular bezel, given the split in the middle of it, I think I'm going to call it a night then. And we will meet again in two, well, is it two weeks or three weeks? It must be three weeks right now because of the longer month. Um, so I'll see you all next time. And I'll try to get the video up. I know some of this is not terribly exciting, that whole watching me file thing, but as we get into the more interesting settings, hopefully we'll have more hands-on visual stuff. Just for the record, it's two weeks. Two weeks, oh, thank you. Goodness, it's almost February, that's scary. <laughs> have a good night, everyone, and uh, feel free to keep posting up on the Facebook group in between, and I'll catch up with you as I can. Good night, all. Thanks, Thank, Thank you. you. Good, Good night. night. Thank you. Good night.